So thank you all for being here. My name is Nia McAllister, and I'm the Senior Public Programs Manager here at the Museum of the African Diaspora. I'm thrilled to have all of you here for our monthly MOAD open mic. And today we have the lovely treat of having poet Nana Boateng as our feature. And so as we begin all of our programs, we like to ground ourselves in the spaces that we're occupying. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramachesh Ohlone peoples, and we pay our respect to the Ohlone peoples and their elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We encourage everyone to learn more about the native lands that you occupy by visiting nativeland.ca, and we'll share that resource in the chat as well. So for those of you who are joining our open mic for the first time, um, I like to again ground us in what this event is. This, this is a space for community, um, one where we bring our whole selves, our spectrum of feelings and experiences where we can share um, and connect with one another and find comfort and joy in each other's company and also affirm, affirm each other's experiences through art and poetry. And so, Basically our event is an open mic. We're gonna start with all of the open mic readers. Um, thank you all for signing up in advance and being a part of today's lovely reading. I know we have a spectacular lineup. Um, and then midway through our open mic, we're gonna have our feature Nana read. So super excited for that. Each of our readers will have about four minutes to share. Um, I'm about to drop the lineup in the chat and I will introduce each reader. If for some reason someone isn't here when I call their name, but they come in later, we'll circle back to them and make sure they have a chance to share. Um, and for those of you who are part of our lovely audience, I encourage you to particip participate by using the chat, using the reactions, any ways to affirm our readers here. Um, but I do ask if you're not the one currently reading, please stay on mute, mute just so we can make sure to hear our readers well. And I think with that, we can kind of just jump right into it. I'm very excited again. Um, to be sharing space with all of you. So first up, I would like to int introduce Michael L.H. Douglas to start us off. Welcome. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? It's so good to be here. Uh, Nana, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's great to read with friends always and, and make new ones. Uh, and please excuse my Midwest allergy voice this evening. Um, I'm Mitchell L.H. Douglas, originally from Louisville, Breeway, land of Breonna Taylor, still on our minds, um, and uh, still looking for justice. Um, so I want to share some new poems with you, uh, ones in my new uh, manuscript. Uh, I had a disturbing experience uh, a while ago, um, and I'm still trying to make sense of it, and this is the first attempt. This poem is called Christening. Five miles from Lima, a sea of focused eyes. This blank squad of brick is not a rest stop. Call it chapel. Call the man in crossbody rosary Messiah. With God, all things are possible. So says the motto of Ohio. It is possible his disciples parted the sea of travelers in the parking lot and led our dreadlock saint across the asphalt, one at each arm. It is possible that after the soft parade, the faithful led the holy to the sanctuary, pushing back the last door on the left. His locks black as a thousand solitary nights, eyes on me, the only other black to be found. He is frozen in this moment, long enough for me to ponder how many years he will remain a charm for chains. How many years his handlers will revel in the spectacle of his neon hymn, Electric Halo. What to say when your mouth won't move, a truth beyond pity. You can fumble for vocabulary, but he's gone, carefully tucked in the back of four unmarked doors, bound for the unseen, the unknown, the unraveling, last exit on the left. So I love hip hop. Um, I've had this thing about hip hop where I'm trying to figure out why there are no liner notes with hip hop albums. Like that really bothers me. Like I love jazz and, and rock, right? And those get liner notes, but hip hop doesn't. That to me says something. 
So I started writing these poems that are like imaginary liner notes for like these big rap albums over the years. And so this is called Liner Notes, NWA and the Posse, 1987. Somewhere where the aerosol buoys you, floating on tags, California fluorescence, who got can control? Who got five on this 20 sack? Glass missiles of eight ball and bud scrape the concrete before raising heads to clouds. Dre talking with his hands now. Beats for days, hitting switches on six fours and crossfaders. And you wander into the middle of this dank alley sunshine, wonder what all the fuss is about. Like, so what? They hit the studio, but ain't nobody playing a note, a string, reading anything, just hollering on a microphone, rapping. Look. Have you ever wondered what tomorrow sounds like? Like if you could dream a soundtrack and when it plays, you saw the days beyond your eyes, the clouds, two-step and revelry. This is it. Yes, this. Yet to be told, you are about to witness the strength of street knowledge. That is another prophecy for another time. This beat so hard it said, what's well, such you claim, one boy said, and all the boys laugh. Dice signs a truce with cinder block walls and asphalt. The brake looks down his nose beyond a pair of lokes. Exhale smoke, asks if you're in. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Mitchell, for starting us off. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Melissa Noel up to the mic. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much, Nia. Um, it's good to be here and be amongst uh, all these very luminary poets uh, here in the room. And I do want to just give a shout to Mitchell. That was incredible, absolutely incredible. And we need to hear more of your work. Um, so everybody has a place that they go to. Everyone has a place that's beautiful to them and everybody remembers a place that has captured them or captivated them. Um, and I want you to think about this place that I have titled A Place Called Brothers. It is ultimately uh, dedicated to our brothers. And I want you to see if you can see yourself in this place. So without further ado, I always wanted to meet Mr. Delicious, Mr. Debonair, Mr. Delightful, Mr. Decent, Dark, Fudge, Chocolate, Holiday Succulent Swirl. At the same time, in the same place, anybody could tell by the look on my face, I was fortunate to embrace a place called Brothers, where today's menu features anything my lady desires within reason, with a side of fresh loving, hugging, kissing, touching, and teasing. You also have a choice of jazz, classical, rap, R&B, gospel, or blues. For those of you who love a deep bass voice melting like spring water down your throat to soothe. Woo! A place called Brothers. Some of them are saturated in silky, cinnamon, crimson looking skin, talking about struggle, family, and single parenting. Some of them are saturated in coconut, almond, cashmere skin, talking about sports, business, and offering financial dividends. Talking, talking, talking about their lives, their loves, their wives, and their sister women friends. You know what? It's just beautiful to see a place for brothers filled with harmony and a sweet song that captures a memory of why as sisters we continually love our brothers. Rich and dark, aesthetically pleasing to the eye, 
the kind of poker too that makes you say, my, oh my, oh my. Yes. Some with funky locks in their hair. Some short or bald. Some with flashback afros standing too tough and too tall. If you ever needed to reaffirm your love and admiration toward one another, do your heart some good and slide by a place called Brothers. Thank you so, so much, Melissa. That was lovely and so musical too in the way that you read. Thank you for sharing that poem. Next up, I would like to invite Gabe Tomlin up to the mic. Welcome, Gabe. Hello, thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, thank you, Nana. Um, we are all such fans of Nana as a person and as a poet and as a writer. Um, so I'm grateful to share space with everybody on this lineup. Um, I've got two short offerings. Um, and yeah. No, I do not love my city. I want to burn my city and hold my niggas close by the fire, hand gently placed above the sacrum of someone I hold sacred. I want to feel the weight of their head against my shoulder as I whisper, we made it, we made it, we made it. But the city is still, is still here, the body is not, and the flaming bush looks foolish aside the bastion of brick, law, and teeth. You can't burn concrete, screams the hood nigga with the megaphone. You gotta blow that shit up. And I've been thinking about it ever since. I've got one more um, very short offering. Grief knows me and all my friends by name. It knows our unborn children. It holds us. Or is it the holding, the embrace of gravity, a field we move through, magnetic and our negatives attracting? What portals have your wounds been? What ethics for travel have you found most suitable for the journey? How do you lift, how do you, how do you lift the weight of loving? Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe, for sharing both of those pieces. Those were lovely. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Tay up to the mic. Welcome. All right, hello everybody. I hope I am. Hope I can be heard. Hopefully, I sound all right. Thank you so much, Nana, for inviting me to be a part of this. Already, I'm extremely excited. So, I have two slightly different pieces, and hopefully, they kind of mesh together. But. Something I, that's been on my mind lately is beauty and rage and old Greek myths. And I'm just going to read about those things. So my first piece is look young forever. Like clockwork, I am reminded that I will love to look young forever. That I will love every moment when I am mistaken for 25 when I am 40. That I will thrive in a world that eats youth and spits it out into its hands that molds all the cracks and the bones into more youth forever. Youth will be sold to me as a virtue, as a reward for good habits and self-destructive behavior, repainted over and over, encased in glass so as not to touch. Beauty will be hung above all by a strand of hair. It will look thin and smooth with edges softened by sandpaper. It will never wrinkle or falter, remain able to manage and easy on the eyes. And when it goes, it will be, go gracefully or not at all. It will be missed long before I die, wrapped in plastic and coveted forever. And then my next one, it is called Medea. It is based off of the Greek figure of Medea. It's an interesting thing. I was getting my hair done and I decided to read Medea while I was getting my hair done. It's very great. Studied hands weave rows across my head, plaiting tight sinew of hair and flesh in black and red. 
I'm quiet and I read about Medea. My tongue traverses the backs of my teeth. On this page, this woman speaks to the air. She rides under the firelight, considers if she has been stolen from her home, promised love and given dirt. She prays for power into the ocean and the sky, drops the arm of her brother into the sea beneath, dreams of a throne on the horizon she has betrayed her home for, queen of the sun and rage and nothing at all. I think of her with my skin. I wonder if she too rips her nails and bites her lips to bleed. I wonder if she prays to the open sky and if they're answered, if the ship sways with her power. I hope she finds her brother in the waves and sews him back together. I wonder if she'll bury Jason in the shores and tear her way back home, cut through the ocean, even if she can't swim. I hope she finds home. That's it, thank you. Wow, thank you. Both of those were incredible and I love hearing the inspiration behind the pieces as well. Thank you for sharing. Next up, I would like to invite Danny Kintos. Welcome up to the mic. Hi, thank you, Nia. Um, and thank you so much, Nana, for inviting me. Um, what, what a lovely reading this has been so far. It's so wonderful to read um, with Mitchell and yeah, your Gabe and um, yeah. So I'm gonna read just a couple of poems. Um, the first one is uh, age 11. A creaky fold out sofa with copper flowers at mom's new old house is the new old bed I share with my sleeping sister while our pet hedgehog runs away. And for months she scratches in the walls, survives on crickets and roly polies until she returns lured by peanut butter and a cage trap metal door snapped shut while I am belly down in a closet clubhouse, flashlight reading the CD booklet to Jagged Little Pill, memorizing lyrics like, I'm brave, but I'm chicken shit. Like, would she go down on you in a theater? I don't know what these words mean, but the feeling of reading cuss words in the dark and the nettled burn of Alanis's voice gives me some kind of power. And mom lets me sing these cusses so long as I promise only at home where it's safe. At school, I'm the girl wearing weird outfits, a blue daisy mini dress over jeans, and everyone talks about me behind their palms. A girl with blonde straight hair asks me where I got it, smiling mean right into my face. And when I dress up like Michael Jackson for a group pro project about the 80s, one sparkly glove and PC hair pulled back in a ponytail, crotch grabbing myself and high pitch voice. I don't break character. I am shameless. The funny girl who didn't get invited to Courtney's freak dancing party, but I do sleep over at my best friend's where we empty her caboodle of eyeshadows and pencils on her bed, smear colors on our eyes, practicing for middle school. I make her watch the dirty dancing tape I snuck in my pillowcase and tell her they do it three times. And with the window down, we see how baby gets put in a corner and Patrick Swayze glazed with sweat and lake water, twisting his shiny muscles to the music. She'll tell her mom the next morning at breakfast crying. She'll say they did it three times. We play the game we call what if while we fall asleep, whispering into each other's hair. What if Duke Prather asked you to prom and gave you his letterman's jacket? Everything that happened to the twins in Sweet Valley we want to happen to us. What if Jack Ulrich gave you a flower unlike any other in the world? Picture the rose from Beauty and the Beast withering under a glass dome. We imagine these boys have been hiding in the air vents the whole time, watching us slip bras off our boyish chests. They elbow each other out of the way for the best view, their faces striped with light, obsessed as we are. I'm just gonna read one more short poem. This is um, Letter to My Childhood Crush after Tia Clark. Dear Duke, Stop doing karate and flexing your tiny bicep on the playground. Stop buzzing your hair and leaving your bangs long. Stop wearing soccer cleats and tube socks to school. Stop looking through me like you can see the field behind me. Stop telling your little sisters to pinch me as hard as they can with the sharp corners of their nails. Stop smiling at Amelia. Stop making that dimple appear on your left cheek. Stop pretending you didn't get the pink letter I kissed and sent to you after I looked up your address in the phone book. 
Stop pushing your forearm to mine on the playground saying, a brown skin can't marry a white skin. I am the kickball here. I am over the hedges, out of bounds, and you with arms above your head run the bases triumphant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. I was about to write out some of those last lines. Those are so powerful. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Ace West up to the mic. Welcome. Hey, y'all. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I have a piece uh, that is untitled. Uh, yeah, I guess I get cracking. <laughs> <clears throat> if death oh sorry yeah let me start over again. if destiny is death and chaos is the constant then why am i to stand in line why am i to be behind why am i ashamed of cause is it because i'm shamed for cause is it because we lost all hope is it because we lost our dope Spark a wick on righteousness, spark a wick on wickedness. Please let us own our own. Please let us own our home. Burning blazes just too hot for the man made of wicker skin. Burning blazes just too hot for the man made of wax. Burning blazes just too hot for the man made of wicker seat. Burning blazes just too hot, douse himself in gasoline. Burning blazes just too hot for the man made of wickedness. There goes all our hopes and dreams, thoughts and stupid sentences. Sell them through the internet. All these truths can now be bought. No need to own your own, you thought. No need to fret in ubiquity. Don't worry, now you're almost free. What am I dealt? A bag full of compliments. What can truly be? Burning blaze is just too hot for the man made of wicker skin. Burning blaze is just too hot for the man made of wax. Burning blaze is just too hot for the man made of wicker seed. Burning blaze is just too hot, douse himself in gasoline. Burning blaze is just too hot for the man made of wickedness. He would rather melt, be to sweat, made of wax, just to feel relief. Resisting all of us, resisting all this righteousness, only to retreat in self. Pity he to righteousness, I cannot pay the fee, just to lose my sense of self just to never be. Burning blaze is just too hot for the man who made a wicker skin. Burning blaze is just too hot, douse himself in gasoline. Douse himself in gasoline, douse himself in gasoline. Douse himself in gasoline, douse himself in gasoline. Thank That's you. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I, I love the use of repetition that you did. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Starry Leo Walker. Welcome. Hello. So hopefully nobody can hear anything in the background. The people next door decided they wanna be really loud like right at this very moment. <laughs> so hopefully y'all can't, y'all can't hear them. Uh, but yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so I'm Starry uh, Lyell from Greenville, South Carolina. And I wanted to say thank you um, to Nana for um, inviting some of her old friends to share the platform with her. That was really dope. I, I didn't expect to see so many familiar faces, so I'm really excited. And I'm happy to see the new faces as well. So I am, hey Gabe, see I see Gabe in the chat. <laughs> so um, I am going to just recite an, um, a poem that's old to me, new to most of you um, here. And hopefully, like I said, there is no, and background noise is like too loud. So um, this is for the black girls y'all think are too loud, too sensitive, too carefree. They are judged before they even speak or when they choose not to speak at all for the ones that like to wear crowns year round because they know who they be yelling A on Saturday nights and amen on Sunday mornings. They are ratchet and righteous. This is not a rant. 
It is a reclamation of power that a black girl needs to resurrect her voice so that it may be louder than the drums at a Southern black Baptist church during an impromptu praise break that spills over into the late afternoon. See me head to toe dressed and hallelujahs and amens blessed, but with a chip on my shoulder still, striving to be better, repelling your judgment because you don't know a thing about me. I am the product of a man's lie and a woman's wishful thinking. I didn't ask to be here, but was conditioned to ask for permission to be me. In the mix of perceived defeat, I once folded my voice into a whisper and tucked it in the second drawer of a caramel dresser that was missing knobs and leaned a little bit, laid in my bed as if it was a casket, gave up, wished that I could just be someone else or no one at all, hid my hope next to the past that would catch my every other month bloody middle school surprise, a period that was always late and early was branded on me as a reason for my bad mood, but in spite of cramps and the same new jeans that your mom just bought for you, sometimes you can just be mad at the world for stampeding all over your truth, your joy, your spirit, like a herd of startled elephants, especially since the last time your voice was actually heard was the day of your birth. I was evicted from my mother's womb, came into this world kicking and screaming with umbilical cord cycles of black wrapped around my neck trying to suffer me. Supposedly I had been born free, but I was born with a rusty spoon in my mouth with an inheritance of trauma and strife that bound my hands. It strains me to reach up and catch my blessings when they are falling from the heavens. Did you know that for a black girl, hell can be four walls painted blue, jay eggshell blue by the devil himself, and she can be an angel that thought that God forgot to give her wings so that she can fly herself to freedom, and she is stuck here until so someone throws her a lifeline in the form of writing lines on a page, then her voice, it finds a way to crawl back inside of her. So now she is loud, screaming to remind herself that her voice does matter, that it can move men and mountains. She is carefree, remembering that, remembering that she used to care so much about what other people thought that it staunched her growth. She is sensitive, remembering the empty feeling of not being able to get out of bed to feel anything and in celebration of everything that she's overcome, now she wears a crown and a smile every single day, walking down the street, bumping Meg the Stallion and Kirk Franklin, twerking because she can, and praising God because she's still choosing life. So don't you dare judge her, even if you think you've learned a thing or two about her. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That so was... once again, thank you guys. Thank y'all for uh, thank y'all in advance because I know this is gonna inspire me to write more and um, like hearing everybody's poem and everything. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Wow, that was an incredible poem um, and delivery, and it makes me happy hearing that this hopefully will inspire some more writing as well. So thank you for sharing. Next up, I would like to invite Carla Brundage up to the mic. Welcome, Carla. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Nia. And hi, everyone. It's so beautiful to be here. Thank you, Nana, to Nana for inviting me. I'm just so inspired by Nana's poetry. And I just want to make a little shout out that she's published in an upcoming book called um, Black Rootedness, 54 Poets from Africa to America. So um, I'm super excited to hear her read tonight. I have two poems I'm gonna share with you. Um, this one I wrote a while ago living in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, it's called White Woman in Africa. Skin alabaster shining. I see her walking from a distance, dust road, Dirt plasters her white legs. They told us not to wear shorts. For six months, I have covered my shoulders against to protect blue sky. White woman arrives uncovered, unaware, shoulders beckoning solicitations, giving all Western women whispered label. Little sons dance. Water down dusty path, shoulders bare in defiance. I cannot allow myself the freedom to dress how I want. 
so European, so American to arrive and not respect the culture. To be in her skin allows freedom to defy all tradition or embrace it as her own. My thoughts swirl maniacally in my head back in the motherland and I am still not free. Voices of respect your elders and respect the culture. You are not an outsider here. You will finally belong, but I don't. Her womb carries the white skin, the right tone to shadow over darkness. I do envy her freedom. She does not even know it's hers. How can she walk in this culture with bare legs? She is always safe. She walks easily in danger, every footstep a grave. And then this next one is called Conquered. For hundreds of years, Christians trekked thousands of miles bearing Bibles and long-winded sleeves, choking Malian warriors with ties, strapping down Zulu breasts, uncinching waist beads to trade in the Americas for land, replacing them with girdles and full-length skirts. Hawaiian tongues cut out to pronounce hymns with high lace collars, hair unbraided into tangled heaps, unlocked and pressed, ironed, clamped, hidden. Christians come in long, hard lines with hard-heeled boots, kicking in doors, shoring knee-high woolen socks. Pants replace ceremony to manhood with submission. Shorts assimilate. In more modern warfare, Christians undress their enemy, promoting bare head, free-flowing hair, breast liberation in bikinis, tattoos and appropriate native piercings. Even waist beads re-emerge without ritual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla, for both of those pieces. It's always a treat to hear your writing. So I'm gonna share a couple pieces and then invite our wonderful feature up. So I, wanted, I do wanna share that Nana and I have had the chance to write together recently. And that's been really helpful for me, um, having been in a writer's block for a while. Um, and we did these really fun brief writing exercises and brainstormed kind of themes and prompts together. And so the two pieces that I'm gonna share um, are what I wrote in the company of Nana and I'm really excited to put them out there. All right, so this first one is entitled Safety Within Reach. For minutes, the dark passageway envelops me, an underwater chamber, a vessel speeding me away from home. And I feel the air lock in my throat. My eyes scan for safety within reach, a water bottle affixed to the commuter's bike, the matching pastel uniform of a city side nurse, her robotic voice announcing our arrival on the other side. I'm learning to fear a place without exit, as if I, as if we, haven't been cargo below water before, to be rocked in stillness and sound, the absence of sunlight in our bones, transported underground to uncertain futures. Four minutes turns to 400 years, and I scan for signs of promise that this too is only temporary. And this next piece is entitled Soul Nourishment. The dial on the oven sticks with the residue of 110 years of cooking oil. A golden glow lights up the crumbs collecting around the rim of the gas stove. Lady of Guadalupe watches every plate fixed. Her presence, a fixture, a promise that around here, we stay fed. My mother's best cooking advice is to cook it till it's done. I scramble to quantify the unrecorded memories, 
the recipe for learning our family's spice routes and waterways, all before the next pot boils over. I suppose we must learn our history by taste. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to introduce our featured poet for this evening. Nana Boateng is a first-generation Ghanaian-American poet, educator, and digital storyteller currently residing in Oakland, California. She utilizes writing and audio to examine memory, otherness, and the myths we tell ourselves. Nana is dedicated to, creating, to curating accessible spaces for people to connect, share, and archive their narratives digitally. Her writing has been published in Connotation Press, WV, WVXU, NPR, Sierra Magazine, Toe Good Poetry, and Literature Journal. In Nana's spare time, she stitches together audio narratives about the African diaspora and teaches K-12 students how to make podcasts. Welcome, Nana. Thank you all so much for having me in this space. Um, one clarifying thing, I don't know if I'm actually first gen. I So that might be a lie, but we can sort that out another time. Um, I feel really honored being in this space. I know a lot of people are thanking me, but I really want to thank you all. Um, I couldn't be here without, um, yeah, just like so many writing communities that I've been able to be a part of growing up. Um, and everyone that is like reading that is a part of the lineup really represents what home is for me. And they are poets and writers who, you know, I just revisit their work often and or just like in memories and that just inspires me to keep writing. So thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to really make sure all of those voices were represented in such a lovely space. Um, I remember when I first moved out to the Bay that the Moad uh, poetry reading was actually the first space that I came um, as like a new writer. And so I'm really glad to be able to share here. Um, I've got a few poems that I'm going to read from and talk a little bit about. Um, and yeah, Bef two things before I start though. Um, and just to like set the tone for the space, I hope if you hear lines, not only just from me, but other people's poetry, you can put that in the chat as a way to celebrate them. I think I have the tradition of you hear and you repeat and kind of honor the spirit of um, what you're hearing. So I hope that can happen. And then um, before the pandemic, I actually had the opportunity to attend um, one of the Lambda Fellowship readings. Um, and it was just so lovely to be in that space and hear their writers. But one of the poets that came up, they have this ritual that they do where um, they just kind of like name the people who have kind of like brought them to this point. And so, and I'm getting emotional, but there are just a few people that I wanna name to honor uh, them. And so just, yeah, I'm gonna just say their names and then I'm gonna start reading. So Lawson, Hawthorne, Turley, and Afusuhimi. So this first poem that I'm gonna read is an old one to me. I wrote this when I was in college and it's called Earrings. And this is kind of like a portrait of where I'm from and who I am. Um, yeah, just growing up, I grew up between in the Ohio River Valley on the Kentucky side. And I spent a lot of summers at Mama Doris's house. She was an older Ghanaian woman who didn't like me, but I spent a lot of time with her. So here we go, earrings. When I was six, I was a boy. At least that's what Mama Doris told me over and over again whenever we visited her home. She lived at the edge of gentrification, down a one-way street where eviction notices read like lost dog posters and children jilted from their homes, barefoot to dance to the ice cream man's jingle. Her apartment was in the last building on the block and the grass surrounding it stretched and curled up its walls like kudzu. Ballroom stairs sat at the apartment entrance, cemented down and cracked, where her neighbors lounged with their necks blackened by the sun. Her door, cladded with three locks, was a neighborhood insurance policy. 
was the first on the left. Inside, the walls were stark white, but plastered with gnatfly bodies that trailed thin streaks of brown guts behind like a comet's tail. Whether I entered in front of my mother or behind her, Mama Doris would fix her eyes where my waist creased into hips and watch the stiffness of my youth move side to side. She traced down my flat length, passing raw mosquito bites and the swelling at my chest and back up to where my polo hung loose at my neck. Nana, she once said, holding my name out until it faded at the tip of her tongue. When will you become a woman? She turned to my mother and shook her head to let her laughter stretch through the living room. A bit down, my mother said, Mama Doris, I am a girl. No, you're a boy she said and massaged her lobes left to right in a circular motion. My teeth pinched at my bottom lip as she kneaded the droplets of skin, turning each over to show the blackened punctures. How can you be a woman if you don't allow yourself to be pierced? Since like I was in first or second grade, I was telling that story where I was like, I hadn't gotten my ears pierced yet. And so I remember just like retelling that to my friends. So um, this next poem is, uh, I'm trying to work on a series of three poems, just three short poems. Um, I still love this movie, Sister Act Two. Watched it like crazy nonstop. Didn't know it was filmed in San Francisco until moving out here. And I was like, what? And so this um, poem that I'm trying to work about on is about just like, um, like that whole movie, she's there to uh, train these black kids. And so I'm trying to write a poem in a series about like this training, this prepping that um, I had to go through as like a child, specifically um, just like the words that I was being taught to say, rather than saying like um, acts, saying ask instead. But I was like so fearful of saying ask because I was like, isn't that close to ass? So um, this poem is called Acts One. Acts one, hold your jaw stiff and let the foo-foo slide back and let the foo-foo slide back and let the foo-foo slide back. My nail beds soak in pepper soup. A sewer's ear could stammer thumb sucking. A punctured kiss, mama would say, teach me. Teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. All right. So um, these next few poems, uh, well, these, yeah, well, this first one is called Cicadas. And um, this is about my mom. My mom, I, she's one of the funniest people um, I know. And like, if you know me, I'm a pretty, I try to be, I'm pretty silly as a person um, because life is so bad and we need to have laughter and joy. And so she really exudes that in so many ways. And whenever I try to read poetry to her, she's like, your poems are too long, I don't wanna listen. So I wrote a short-ish poem for her. Um, and this time last year in Kentucky, I think it was the 17th year or the cicadas had come back out after 17 years. And so I was home for a little bit with my mom and we were just like spending a lot of mornings just waking up early and going on long walks and just like seeing the cicadas, letting them bump into us. If you've ever been around cicadas, they are just aimless. They'll bump into anything, crawl on everything. So this is like a moment capturing that. Um, and yeah, just thinking about being slow with my mom and like 
just representing the time that we spend together. She was battling, she was battling breast cancer. And so this was just culminating into that. So um, this is called Cicadas for my mother mercy. Illumined nymphs dig their way back up, a thirst for life's dude armor, unseeved gold calloused in the weeds, like clipped marigolds spring forth prodigal birth, dirtied by sun exposure. Newly awakened chatter pulses. It lines the horizon, a sonic pathway landing directionless babes. They crown the thorn beam, twisting and dampening fizzed air, a rooster's song wavers. Short-lived, could you believe that solitude felt so familiar? A squirming rage unearthed, tickles in eager broods underbelly, blinded by light, squeezed between braided fingers, but content with their fitful dance. Without credo, a fumbled mass of soft bodies collide. Ached tubers smash as plucked wings drift. Without occasion, clanked glass falls at our shoulders. Without break, a sticky mouthless choir propels. I'm alive, alive, alive. Fraying the street noise, mama hums back. So. Sorry. Sometimes I get really emotional when I read my poetry just because I'm an, uh, overwhelmed, but it makes me really happy to share that. Um, so yeah, thank you all for holding space for that. Um, also, I've been, <laughs> this is funny because um, Sharon and some of the people that are in our, I've been going to, I love this class that I've been going to. It's um, a Tuesday poetry class. We just read poetry and then talk about it. And Sharon, she invited me to it. She's going to be reading soon. And um, we've been reading a lot of transcendental poetry. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you're like, why is she reading all of these descriptive nature things? Um, because I can. And also, I just love being like a Black person in nature. It's so disruptive. And also, it's we it's within our reparations. And um, rest and play are resistance. So I say that all to get into this next poem called A Lament or Blue Poem. Um, I've been, uh, I'm sick right now, if you can hear it in my voice, but I've been just trying to really reevaluate for myself what um, community looks like, intentional community, and um, this poem is just kind of like capturing a moment or moments where um, you might be with people, but you feel so lonely, and uh, trying to understand like being alone is lovely and beautiful and empowering and being able to find strength in that, but moving through kind of like the pain of having to, the pain of realizing that. The, um, so this is, um, this is in multiple parts. So lament or blue poem. One, seaside, I kneel in a trove of bric-a-brac. Overlooked forties and stubbies rinse in the surf. Malt rhinestones bevel in starlight. Cross-linked, amber erisions drip as kelp goiters pop and waving mangroves petrify in the wash. Nearing tides swallow pennies and expand, tossing caution outward. Its lather turls my ankle loops and returns for a calving hind as rocks swirl into the shoreline. Hunched, I pick threads of polyester flossing in the cove and make room for barnacled granite. Butterflied, I pair split mollusk and chase a tattered, tattered feather, but the offering is swept. Lone pincer redeems me, a prond grip of supine possibilities. What was your life before me? 
fallen tangor. A forgotten skeleton key slipped over pinky and stowed in ravenous palms, like stymied Lucy dislodged on crumbled ziggurats, an unthinkable surrender, outtowing stride, but enduring to a fault. I release another red stone. Two. Three mangoes go droopsy and elongate in plastic. A slow abrading fever blotches. Mucus hardens and clots. A red auger fouls the air. One by one, an army swarms gangrenous flesh, hopscotching black and white tiles. They salvage remnants of my hunger, a crossroad. A march and march the maze on and on and on. Together we gnaw at the flavor and thrash in the night. Three. Dark cysteines bite into the sky as rolling tongues confess. And I wake, mouth gaping. Lightning breaks a garland of wild flowers, hover over me, and I wake. A dreamt warning blurs. We don't have a name for you. I wake, slipping through an open window. On the sill, dry seeds rock, cooing me back. And I wake, bloodshot. Tearful gratitudes form nimbus estuaries, tugging my body to the surface of these patch gargantuans, a balmy surrender I wake from. All right. Thank you all for letting me cry. <laughs> Thank you all for letting me read. This is my final poem. So um, my poetry is nowhere, so you can't read it, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I like that. I like to gatekeep. But um, one thing that I do, I haven't done it right now because some locals, I'm happy. I was going to tell Nia, if there are any locals in this Zoom, you got to take them out. But there are some locals that had me fucked up. And I have a show, um, it's an online radio show that I took a pause on for right now, but it's called Down Bad and Other Things. And in that space, I talk to writers, poets specifically, but I'm trying to expand writers, creatives about the things that have them down bad. So the things that are, you know, causing them desperation during their writing process to help fuel their creativity. Cause I definitely think that, yeah, my down badness really is a fuel to some of like uh, my mania helps fuel me a lot of times. I've just put the link to it in the chat. Um, it's not the greatest show, but I am getting better. And um, you can hear that. But I share that to say this poem is about a crush, about multiple crushes. That's another component of the show. We talk about crushes. And this poem is also very early, early draft. So, um, Delight in that. Uh, this is called En Mass Hot. Um, and if you all know, whew, it's been a long, arid summer, but these are kind of, I guess, the epigraph, a few things to intro the poem. Um, paranoia comes a cool, beaded refreshment. So that's from Moonstruck. The earth is already soaked with my tears. I will weep no more. Um, from Christopher Okemwa. He was in the anthology that Carla was talking about, Black Rootedness. Please get that book. Um, if, that, if that freak comes looking for me, I'll be ready. That's from Static Shock, season two, episode five. And then water is no longer safe to drink anymore on earth. You, uh, Yahoo News. So here we go. In a fantastical heat, I push lemon seeds down the drain. You tell me I want to listen to Butterfly on a hot day at home in Texas, but I can't believe you. A broken promise lasts a lifetime in this kind of heat. The day sits yoked, a bird in hand, a swiping thumb, a heated stalemate. Daylight chews at my neck, triple digits, angels dizzying sight. A downward dog type heat, gargoyled on the block, big red machine heat like offering honey for diesel, 
no mountains or valleys or rivers, just two burning bushes, technicolored, smoked out thought, marble stuck in chocolate fudge. It's getting there tight, shoulders cast ironed and guzzled in, turtles for days, wipe a nigga's nose type, ugly as hell. Another dog day drips from my gingered lips, air fish boned in my throat type, hock a loogie, let it dangle type, through the bayou of uncharted time, onions curl the eyes type, a grimacing got you waddling type, Buddha fingers on your knees type, it makes no sense type, folded arms caped overhead, the trees remember the drought, cars cannibalize, a runny banana split type, bend the cherry stem, get tongue tied, white people yelling at folk music at a folk music concert stick your head in boiling water gooseneck barefoot running on sunflower seeds type just professionally hot tell people to hold their farts type monkey see monkey do type stars and stripes forever type a two-headed basilisk with a million rolling eyes, jean talons scratching. You smell barbecue all over, skin corroded even with 50 SPF. It really doesn't matter. Helicopters pass three times type. Niggas marching to Sousa on cracked cement, breaking all their boom. I gotta say that line. Niggas marching to Sousa on cracked cement, breaking all their baby mother's backs. It was a, it was hotter than tri triple dog dare. It was hotter than a triple dog dare. Montezuma to triple Lee type. Mud cupped in three fat braids. Motion with my hands and we're all weakly agreeing type. Iced fruit at my joints. Oh, but I'm really the problem type. It'll happen right back like you're looking in a mirror type. All right, thank you all. Thank you, Nana. Wow. Let's virtually give it up again for Nana. That was an incredible round of poems and you left me still wanting to hear more and more and more. Um, so I'm sad we can't find your poems anywhere, but you know that's the magic of this space because we're all lucky to hear them in person here. Um, and thank you for dropping the link to your podcast. Everyone, please go check it out, support, listen, all of that. It's, it's wonderful. Um, so thank you, Nana. This is such a treat to get to hear your poetry and to share space with you. And thank you also for inviting all of these incredible poets to the space. Like this has been such an incredible evening and we're only halfway done with all the poets. So with that, I'm excited to invite up our next readers for the second half of the open mic. And we're going to kick it off with Mars. Welcome, Mars. Oh, hello. I'm from Japan right now. So I'm so sorry if you actually hear the cicadas and the road noise. I don't have any Wi-Fi in my house. So I'm outside of the cafe. I just want to share a brief poem with you all um, after thanking Nana profusely for even inviting and thinking of me as a writer and a peer was really um, heartwarming, you know? Also, I love all the emotional vulnerability and everything that's going on here. So uh, let's get into it. Um, <laughs> our watch pot doesn't boil any faster. I've long been waiting for the steam to rise. My eyes won't rush it, so soon they run dry. It's our own hunger, leaving us so unwise. The mouth stretched over the eyes. Can you feel it in your gut? Death by a thousand cuts. I've long been waiting for the sun to rise. My eyes won't rush it, so soon they run dry. It's our own hunger that keeps us long left wanting someone to die. Can you feel it in your gut? Death, 5,000 cuts. So uh, that poem had many iterations and finally I uh, came to this. It's actually supposed to be a song, but it takes quite a bit of time to go through. So I made it a little bit more in sync, but like succinct. But the image I had started off was thinking about like climbing a mountain in the air being so thin when you're high in the peaks. It reminded me of steam. And when I was younger, I'd want like my mac and cheese with my dinner 
what my mom would say, a wash pot never boils any faster. So we're always sort of left waiting at the mercy of that pot to decide when to boil. And thinking like, oh, I could add salt, it would boil faster. Or if the water were purified, maybe you would never see the boil, the like bubbles pop up at all. So I think about how I'm constantly just like waiting and much of my like hunger is swept up in like the intersections I exist in. And I'm, I'm hungry for validation, for power, for equity, but I'm supposed to be patient and water is only supposed to take three minutes to boil, but it, it decides when it boils. Um, we're just sort of at its mercy. Um, that was two minutes. So I'm actually gonna call it here. Thank you guys so much for having me and I can't wait to hear everything uh, that goes on next. Thank you so, so much Mars for sharing that and what a lesson that is in patience and waiting. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Tania Russell. Welcome up. Hi, everyone. My name is Tania Deshawn. That means queen to whom God is gracious. It's also like 90s Black baby, and that's all me. Um, Nana, I love your spirit um, and your poetry. Just like, I don't have the words. It just makes me really happy just to, you know, be in the presence of your art. So I, with all that said, I will read two poems. Um, I also love the habitual bee. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and I love that part of our, our language. So this poem is called Black Girls Need Less Comfort by the Age of Five, and this is a statistic that's found in a study that I am obsessed with. Girlhood is the myth. Enters Deja smelling of baby magic. She be swaying her head side to side, ringing a symphony of rainbow colored beads. She be a musician. Her eyes, two small suns, her voice unpasteurized honey. And at the tender age of five, why would any God disapprove of her? Unless God is a teacher with dandelion confidence, each inquisitive remark a win from hair eye roll when she couldn't have her way a threat to the education system's ego, an excuse for parent teachers meeting a cause for expulsion. The weight of Deja's world oscillated between girl and woman then stalled on the wrong end of the pendulum too soon for too long. Her words became lemon rinds and raw turnip greens. Her aura, pungent coffee with no cream. The comfort she received was milk curdled. No teacher to say, baby, what do you need? And no family to give her a little sugar to keep her sweet. So that's that way. And then I also love psychology, hence, the virtual background. Uh, <laughs> so this is called Psychology of Maturation. And I'll just recite this one. Uh, okay. Adulthood ravished my girlhood like a relaxer on virgin hair. This world can break you down until you are deconstructed and unrecognizable. And some might even open their mouths to call your deterioration beauty that you know that you lose approximately five brain cells every time you get a relaxer wisen up while you can. There is always someone counting on your insecurities and need for conformity to make you look dumb. The brain doesn't reach full maturity until you're 25 years old. Specifically the prefrontal cortex, also known as the decision-making center of the brain. So forgive yourself for the drunken nights, for not understanding that nice men can be nice narcissists, for not believing in your dreams the first time they sparked within you and on the days when your skin is a mind filled of triggers breathe. You are grown and safe and your body is the best place to be right now. Your mind is a center for restoration rest. Did you know that the brain has its own cleansing system that's only active when you sleep? Scientists believe that the buildup of proteins left behind by the lymphatic system is the leading cause for Alzheimer's, which is to say, it's the things that keep you up at night that will make you forget yourself, forget the people who love you most or your favorite songs. You know, I'm so glad to be grown in mind, not just body. Someone asked me when I first felt like an adult, I was 25 and it tasted like honey and lavender tea in the morning, praying away the demons and they actually fled and I, was no longer afraid. Thank you so much, Nana. So much love for you. Thank you. Mm. 
Thank you so much, Tania, for that piece. I feel like I have chills. I'm like so many things to process. That was an incredible poem. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Mika to zone up to the mic. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Mika. Um, so I got to write both of these poems um, at Governor's School this summer. And I know a lot of us know each other uh, through Governor's School in this space. That's how I know Nana. Um, so it's always really, really special um, to be back with my Kentucky family. Um, so I'm going to read two poems. This first poem, um, while at Governor's School this summer, um, being around my students, we realized we have a lot of unaddressed trauma from organized religion. Um, so this first poem is called Sunday School. People often mistake me for a soft girl, but my insides were created from silver bones, carved from forced visits to mass and knees so bent from half-told confessions, my skin became a liability to God. My tita often told me that I'd never make it to heaven if I kept talking to boys the way I did. Little did she know, I did not ask for their liturgies. They simply built a mortar church around me and forced my body to their sacraments. I write letters to God during Sunday school and ask why soft girls are often prey to hounds, pray to fathers who wield fists, pray to leaving tapes that say, anak kailangan ko, Nang umalis. My gun is more important than my daughter's. I ask the priest through a bullet torn wall, how do I reach purgatory? He tells me I have messed up the order of my sins and 12, 12 Hail Marys full of grace should absolve me of myself. I hold my hands out for the Eucharist. I am not reaching for sainthood, I am reaching for girlhood. I open to hymns that don't acknowledge soft girls, but sing praises of brick boys and riff the treble chords off key. I dip stained hands in holy water, tongue the stamps for scarlet envelopes to heaven, praying for a winged reply. I will repeat this hallowed ritual until the next Lord's day, where our fathers will continue to shell our bodies apart in sacred communion. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith, amen. All right, so the second poem, um, I had the opportunity to write um, for the second session of Governor's School, um, the graduation, a graduation poem. Um, and I wanna shout out Mitchell real quick because this poem would not have taken shape without him. So thank you. Um, so this poem is called A Homecoming. Our bodies are vessels for withered pages, born from tethered trees, technicolor ink tucks itself into corners of summer skin. We watch as the sun wraps her hands around the maps of our palms, fingers attempt to trace where we've been before. Our chests rise in full moon size, reflecting on how many cups of folklore it took to get to this place. How do we call for home when we've never stuck around long enough to catch our breath? Thunder trembles coffee stains and bluegrass. Fever dreams spill over into a dusk we had forgotten about. We call back to wayward hounds that circle front porches and bones of amber streams where we would splay our hands below the cool buzz of Appalachian waters. We remember crisp colas sipping to the sound of a bunting's holler and take refuge in the fact that our memories have made space out of every burrow of light it could possibly find. How do we name a home when the wind is ripe with uncertainty? The path to our current destination mists, dense with pretense and schoolyard rituals. We must admit we do not know where we are going, but we enjoy the aerial tango all the same. Perhaps this is what a homecoming looks like, the gathering of maybes into a collected fist and the prayer that when fingers unclench, they will form roots. We gather our vessels, release remaining fever dreams, refill our technicolor ink and breathe in, count to 10, exhale. Thank you guys. Thank you so, so much for both of those pieces. And it makes me so happy seeing how all everyone's poetry is intersecting and being informed and influenced by each other. So thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Zoe Williams up to the mic, welcome. 
Hi, everybody. Um, it's so wonderful to be here with all these really talented and inspiring poets. I want to say thank you to Nana. It's just lovely to be a part of the creative spaces you continue to make. Also good. Um, so I'm going to read uh, three. And this first one is called A Poet's Betrayal, Why I Deleted Instagram. I tell you I want to write beautiful things that leave you full. You say, watch this. Red oozes forth and drips down between curved white as I smile with newly cracked teeth and cut gums. I tell you I want to write beautiful and delicate things. You touch my cheek with all 15 fingers and say, watch this, before driving far under a white blue sky with someone else in the passenger seat. What a fool I was to lend you the pen and paper. Um, and this next, these next two are inspired by the time I was in my room with COVID. Um, <laughs> so you must have lost your mind inside the room with four pale blue walls. And now day has turned to night and it is suddenly morning until it is dark again. And I used to be something or at least I used to be somebody who was going to turn into something else. But that gold headstone and casket is upstate and I can't remember the last time I looked in the mirror and a heavy panting snarl wasn't staring me back. And I tell people I like girls now, but I'm not sure I like anybody enough to let down the drawbridge over the great moat I dug with no longer gentle hands that I could not help but fill with gallons and gallons of blood. And this is the final one. Inside the room with four pale blue walls, I ask you to join me in remembrance of that time I got drunk and started talking like the kids from my first neighborhood. My sentences became clipped and I dragged all the consonants from the middle of words behind my top front teeth with the tip of my tongue so I could bury them in my throat. Of course I called you ma'am before entering. That night, lost letters fell out of a wide mouth a heavy aftertaste. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for sharing all three of those pieces. They're, they're sitting with me, thank you. Next up, I would like to invite Sharon Elswit up to the mic, welcome. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of the community that's celebrating Nana as poet after celebrating her as writing director of 826 Valencia's podcasting center where helping volunteers help students find their voices. And when I was stung on the same year, two Fridays in a row, right, standing right outside my door, I realized that bumblebee wanted to tell me something and wrote it down. And um, the bee's monologue also appears in this month's Noe Valley Voice, and I'll read it. Bombus Bosnesensky has your ear. Yes, the two stings were me, same be, we women carry the swords honed sharper than words, messengers to bumbling giants. You didn't listen when flight muscles vibrating, I murmured, I live here too, there in the hole around the water pipe. Under the stair I serve the queen who burst me and 50 sisters in that May clutch. No, you do not deserve to hear from me whether a child will become a poet if I land on her lips, that it's honeybees who sting and die. Look us up and then plant yarrow, lavender, blackberries, rosa californica, and next time, if you're lucky, you will see me, worker black with a tuft of yellow hair up front, fly straight to the answer. No random Corsica fancy, this is serious survival. I forage where no other has licked before. Colony, me, flower, plum. You want plums? We're fighting to be acknowledged here, so if your ear hurts, hmm, this is no apology. And for Nana, who knows the agony and exhilaration of choosing just the right words to pulse her delectable images with mystery and sensuality. 
I offer this humble poem about picking a perfect fruit. Plumderable, pluck puckery sweet pluot sunning in the bowl, ripe seduction, saliva pools, pick which ruby globe will be less its full self tomorrow? Plunging teeth into flesh, juice trails down to your elbow. Surely such nectar must be forbidden. And your hands and smile are sticky and you feel only a little guilty and wonder if it's possible to plant the pit. And that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. Both of those poems were lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, I would like to invite Zaria up to the mic. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Zaria Mosby, and I wanted to start off by saying thank you and that I'm super honored to be able to be in a space with all of these incredible um, poets and I have two pieces for you guys today that I uh, hope you'll really enjoy. This first one is called A Litany for Strength, which is after um, A Litany for Survival by Audrey Lorde. For those of us who have only ever known survival, who have only known doing exactly what you had to do because you had no other option, always keeping your eyes forward because we are constantly laying our dreams to rest behind us, for those of us who are who we are because of who we are afraid of becoming, soy quien soy por medio de miedo, I am who I am through fear. For those of us who have learned how to be scared in secret, smothering our screams and our grandmother's brown gravy because granny never screamed. For those of us who never got our heads out of the clouds, who saw our dreams up there, who were clawing at them like a cat trying to climb a tree, never stopping. And um, the second one is one that's pretty personal to me and it's called An Ode to Boys Who Die Young. This poem was written for the boys who reached their funeral before their graduation, who left permanent scars on their mom's heart, whose death incited a new cycle of violence fueled by pain. This is an ode to the boys who die young. To all those who lost someone too soon, or attended a funeral of the young, there's a few things you may have noticed. The people who simply knew him seem to rally together. They stand with smiles on their faces as they laugh, take pictures and dance as if this is a celebration and not a solemn affair. But his true friends, those who spent the most time with him can't bring themselves to smile. Most of them look sick to their stomachs as they stare at the doors of the funeral home, daring themselves to go in. You'll notice the way his cousins stand, how they huddle together, how they sway as they look at his body, how they cry like they've never cried before. His sister can't seem to stay in the same place for very long, like she's afraid that if she stands still, the grief will catch up to her. The distant look in his brother's eyes says a thousand words. The pain behind his stare is so powerful, you begin to feel it too. His father's emotions seem to fluctuate from one extreme to another as we watch him change from grief stricken to joyous and celebrating the life of his son. You can feel the way his mom shakes when you hug her. You can see the pain on her face as she clutches her chest, crying out for her baby. The memory of the boys who died young will always haunt you. Anytime that you hear a gunshot, you will see his face and at night you will think you can hear him calling you. The boys who have died young feel like they're still here because the family thinks that it wasn't his time. We allow him to live in our minds and live in that place between realities. We think that if we hold our memories tight enough, it will bring him back or at least make him feel like he's not really gone. But the tighter your grip is, the more reality seems to slip through your fingers. Maybe if we keep his name alive, it will feel like we still have a piece of him. Maybe if we trend our hashtags, put his face on our t-shirts and wear his name in gold across our chest, it will feel like he didn't die so young. Thank you. Wow, thank you so, so much for both of those pieces and for sharing that in this space, thank you. 
Next up, I would like to invite Elise up to the open mic. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me. I just have one piece tonight. I look up at my sisters in the sky, sitting high and fine. They shine stretching wide for miles. They glisten like chiseled gold from the mines. I wonder how they mustered up the courage to sit so high with no apology without making themselves smaller for the world's convenience. I worry what that life could be like. I ponder on how the journey to success would feel like on such a linear and unaltered route. I'm used to wanting to win, but only when it's convenient, when it's appropriate. I am told through so many falsified and daring phrases that I am too full, too plump, too chunky to chew. I am told that I'm owed success if I dial myself down and become edible. Prepare myself for the taking. Attend my own funeral just a few minutes late. Me and my sisters are force-fed the belief that the only way that we will succeed is if we dilute ourselves so we will be easy to swallow. I'd rather choke. I look up at my sisters in the sky and applaud their elegance. So much honor, so much pride, so much love that brings me to tears. Some call them stars, but I know these are my sisters. Sisters that look out for me, keep count of my dreams, and protect them from the greedy blazing sun and the complacent clouds. Sometimes I wonder about all my sisters who couldn't embrace their glow, whose taste buds rejected the taste of acceptance, a metallic and savory one, who couldn't bear the scent of greatness, which smells of ripe courage and destiny with notes of two bros My mind fumbles to the thought of my sisters who fell from their thrones. Didn't anyone cushion their turbulent fall? Who practiced the stars when they fall from the sky? Whose callous palms are prepared for my fallen queens? Nobody? Nobody at all? Who will pick them up? and wipe away their packed tears? Who will assure them that no harm is near? Is there anyone who will fail? Or is it that my sisters lose their beauty once they fall? Do they lose their magic when they lose their way? I believe I'm on the wrong side of the night, so busy adoring the moon and its false pride that I've let my sisters fall. Hello, dear sisters who have fallen into the sword. If you could just turn your head upward, you'll see me. And me, you'll see you. Just barely keeping my balance while we keep spinning. I've come to brush you off and sit you up on your own two feet and watch you stumble until you soar. My sisters, I don't think I can be without you anymore. Death hollers at us to hurry up. I whisper, use your inside voice and I'll think about it. I need you and your extra large dreams. I don't want to see you neat and pretty while you be devoured so savagely. No more playing it safe. It's time for us to soar. My sister in the sky, I'm ready when you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise, for that poem. That was beautiful. And I absolutely love the, the cadence that you read with. Thank you for sharing. I would like to invite Drew up to the mic next. Welcome, Drew. Hello, how are you all doing? Um, it's been really like a beautiful, beautiful evening to listen to everyone read. Everyone has read, I don't know, I've heard so many distinct voices and everyone had something really important to say and it's an honor to share this space with everyone. Um, I'm just reading one poem tonight. This poem is titled, You Beautiful. 
and my Irish greedy tide pool. I am the starfish, unseeing eyes in a restless condition. Am I tender like the navel? I am ripest where once plucked in orchard. We were swaying like young trees, soft wood pulp and too wet to be burned, at least as kindling. The first winter is the hardest. In the spring, when thaw comes, I sink my fingers as claws and talons into uptilling earth. I will germinate seeds, petal soon, and pluck them gentle. Aren't I sweet, a caress, a sigh, the lilt of something too delicate for my mouth to wrap comfortably around. I guess I am not a sweet thing and I am proud of this acquired taste. Did you know really ripe passion fruit tastes like bubble gum and the seeds roll around your mouth like you were the sea? Haven't we all raged storms like sinking ships or maybe I am alone, an island, an iceberg, a cold thing. Sometimes I am frigid to the touch, but I only ask you to be gentle. Why must the wasp die for my fig? Such is life. And we are wasps sometimes, ripping out our own wings to taste sweetness, but we are figs and things will die for us to live. Our own dreams, someone else's. I was an idea, vaguely, hazy, in someone's mind once. I still am. Someone told me that two things can be true at once. She said, say and and not but and that is all for me thank you everyone for listening thank you so so much drew for sharing and what a wonderful note to close on um i just want to thank all of our readers this evening this has been such a full evening of poetry and to have so many new voices in the space is such a treat and i want to big give a big thank you to nana for not only being the feature this evening and sharing your wonderful poetry, but also bringing all of these people together. And it makes me happy seeing people who know each other from different communities and different spaces, being able to share virtual space together and support each other's poetry. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to our very attentive and active audience as well. Um, it really makes me happy being able to hold this space with all of you and have everyone engaged um, and celebrating each other. So this is an ongoing series. This We have the, this open mic every month. So I invite you, those of you who read, those of you who are in the audience that might want to share next time, please do come back. Um, the next open mic will be on Thursday, September 15th. And we're really lucky to have poet Ashia Ajani as our feature. And we'll drop the link in the chat so you can register, you can sign up to read, sign up to attend and watch. We would love to have you back in the space. This is also one of many things that MOAD is doing. Many We have so many programs going on both in person and virtual. So those of you located in the Bay, those of you elsewhere, we would love to have you support the work that we're doing at the museum. So whether that's coming to our programs, becoming a member, making a donation, any and all ways of engaging with the work that we do are really meaningful for us. And kind of on that note, we would also like to hear from you, um, any and all thoughts and feedback from, from today's program. We're gonna drop a link in the chat for a quick survey. And we would love to hear what more programs you would like to see, um, what you've enjoyed. So thank you all for just being a part of today's evening. Thank you, Nana. And I hope all of you will come back and continue supporting the work that we do at MOAD. So with that, take care and have a wonderful rest of your evening or your day, wherever you may be located. Thank you.